Darren Deaton, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So you and I, we met a few years ago at a starting strength seminar because you're a starting strength coach who was auditing the seminar. So that's one of the requirements. And so we've interacted before then, but you've got an interesting background. Besides being a starting strength coach, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. So I've been a doctor of physical therapy for 28 years. I'm the founding partner of a orthopedic and neuro physical therapy practice group, Dallas, Fort Worth, North Texas area. I'm also a starting strength coach. I think I've been a starting strength coach since 2012 or 13. And I'm on starting strength uh, staff, uh, on the seminar staff, teach at some of the seminars. I'm also a USAW sports performance coach and also a CrossFit level, what they call level three trainer. So I've gone through three different levels of their coaching training. So I've had a, a varied background in fitness. My wife and I actually met over 30 years ago when I was uh, actually 31 and a half years ago, when I was 19 years old in a, in a health club. I was a personal trainer of sorts, and uh, she worked there also, and that's that's kind of where we met there in the junior college too when I was taking some summer classes. So so I've been in the fitness industry in the uh, for you know over 30 plus years. I've been in physical therapy for close to that too. So the background that I have in relationship to the the lifting community, is uh, more specifically with starting strength. I'm also a starting strength online coach on the starting strength online coaching uh, product that Matt Reynolds uh, started a little over a year ago, which is a great product for lifters who don't have access to a personal coach one-on-one -on -one in a physical presence. It's great to have um, good eyes on coaching. So that's that's about my background. I think that I'm a little different in the sense that, and so are my clinics. I have two partners in my practices. Uh, we have four different locations here in the area. And in our practice, we have a barbell rack uh, or a squat rack, I guess you would say, a power rack, barbells, bumper plates, steel plates. And we use a lot of traditional barbell training in our clinics for strength training because we feel like it's probably the most effective tool that we have in our hands. So that's that's pretty much it. All right. So barbell training, your primary practice, which is weird because you're a physical therapist. I've been to the seminar. I've, I've in, at the seminar, RIP, like pretty much went after physical therapists, like they don't know anything. So how did you, a physical therapist, get into starting strength, barbell training, particularly starting strength? So Basically, I went to the, the starting strength seminar, I think in 2012. Uh, that's when I got my certification. I got this, my certification at the same time. You know, I attended the first seminar, sat for the platform test, passed the platform test and the exam, and then became a starting strength coach. But there was a period of time there for probably at least three to four years where I did very little within the community of starting strength just because of my practice life was busy. Um, I, I had CrossFit gyms, but as a, you know, I was, I'm a big reader when it comes to strength. And uh, so I kept reading, you know, I've read starting strength, uh, the barbell method, and then also practical programming and then several other texts. And it just continued to intrigue me. So I continued to follow it. And later I, I ended up getting involved again back with the starting strength community. I'm now on staff as a staffer, do staff some of the seminars. But, you know, if you, as you know, when you go to the, when you go to the seminar, PTs are not held in a very high light. And, and in a lot of ways, that's to be, they earn that because of the way that we have talked about strength training and barbell training within the medical community. So, uh, it's hard. It's hard to survive as a PT in the starting strength community. <laughs> you, you have to have pretty thick skin. But I think that uh, it makes sense to me. Barbell training is very methodical. It's very predictable. It also, from a science standpoint, when you think about physics and moment arms and loads and force production, it you, it just makes sense to a to a didactically thinking mind, someone who is very analytical. It makes sense, and so I couldn't get rid of that. The more that I learned, the more that I got around other starting strength coaches and and Mark Ripito, the more I realized that this this is really the method that I want to promote as the primary strength training model, both in my clinics and also in my gyms. So let's talk about some of the myths that exist in the medical field, but particularly the physical therapy profession. Because we've had Jordan Feigenbaum 
on the show, who's a medical doctor, also starting strength coach. We talked about some of the, the, the myths that even just like family practitioners have about barbell training in particular, but what are the, the big ones you see in the PT world about weight training or barbell training in particular? Well, first, I think, I think the average consumer or client of, a, of the medical community needs to understand that when it comes to strength training, when it comes to the development of strength, PTs, prob- PTs definitely get more academic training than medical physicians, both DOs and MDs do. Uh, but physicians get very little um, education when it comes to strength training, endurance training, just just anything outside of, of medicine. And so the idea that a physician would be the expert in that field or even you know, the, the physical therapist um, is, is probably not accurate. But a lot of the misconceptions that are out there is, first of all, when it comes to the barbells, that it's, you know, the movements are dangerous, that you should isolate movements, that you should do individual exercises that are smaller movements. And there are some cases where we have to be careful with patients when we're talking about the rehabilitation side, post-operative care, injuries where there's structural issues, then then there are certain times where we have to be careful about how we intervene with those exercise activities. But there is a significant difference, as you know, between exercise and training. And so I think it's, I think it's important that people recognize that, that the barbell is, is probably in my mind, at least. And I think in, in a lot of the minds of, of a lot of strength coaches and several PTs I know and physicians like, like Jordan and Austin Baraki, who's also a physician, Dr. Jonathan Sullivan. And that would be that the barbell can be a great tool. It's very safe. A lot of people think it's not safe, but it's extremely safe. It, it promotes compound movement versus isolated movement. And we know that compound movement is safer to the joint because it stabilizes the joint. It stabilizes the surrounding tissue, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, whenever I've preached, you know, hey, to people, you need to get started with barbell training. I've had a lot of guys, particularly older guys in their 40s or 50s, they say they've got a bad back. Is that something that can prevent people from barbell training if they, you know, have got a a bulging disc or something like that? What what goes on there? What's your prognosis as a, as a physical therapist? No, I th- I think that the last thing that someone needs to do is stop strength training when it comes to the uh, back injury. You know, a strong back is a healthier back, and and we know that through the literature now and through research that a back that's weak hurts more. Backs that have larger musculature, better stability and support. It supports the the tissue that's been damaged. It supports the disc, the ligamentous structures, and the the, the spine itself. So, you know, I, I I don't tell too many people this, but most of the people that that hang around with me, in my circles, know this. But uh, two years ago, I I had four low back surgeries in the same calendar year. So I had three laminectomy discectomies at the same level, and then I eventually had a lumbar fusion uh, at L4, L5. So as a PT, you know, that's, you know, when you think about that as the, the, the myriads of patients that I've treated all these years, it's, uh, that was pretty discouraging. But I had a condition called spondylolisthesis. I had an unstable segment. The only way to finally take care of that was through surgery. So, and I'll just tell you that getting back under the barbell, over the last two years has been the best thing that I could have ever done for my back. The other day I, I squatted for three sets of five, my, my old PR for a single rep prior to back surgery. I'm deadlifting for a set of five, what I used to PR. Uh, and so, you know, when I, when I talk to clients, specifically patients, but also members that were within our gyms or when I have one-on-one clients through strength training sessions, I tell them, you know, there's a lot of misconception out there about lifting weights and bad backs. If you're a physician or within the community that you hang around with, if they tell you, you know, you don't need to be lifting heavy weights anymore. The, the one thing we hear all the time is, and you've probably heard this, Brett, don't, don't lift more than 10 pounds, right? <laughs> I mean, don't lift more than 10. You're, ne- you're never to lift anything more than 10 pounds and don't ever bend over. You should squat with your legs only. Well, you and I know that that's, that's not the proper way to use the hip and the back. It's a lever. So it should be used as a lever. That back needs to stay straight. But the hip is the driving force for that, the hip, the glutes, the hamstrings. And so what we try to do with our patients now and our clinics and what I try to do with my strength training clients is help them understand anyone can lift a barbell and get stronger in the hips and low back. 
a lot of back pain is what we call non-specific low back pain, and the best way to treat that is with strength training. Yeah, I think that's a great point because I, I've read that in other places that there's like research on like Home Depot employees who wear those back braces. They tend to have more back injuries than people who don't wear the braces, right? Because they they're basically relying on that belt to act as an exoskeleton for them. So they get a week back, and then whenever they're at home with the thing off, and they pick up a load of laundry, they pull their back, and then they they're out for a while. Yeah, I think there's this mindset or this thought line that's created that it can be pretty pervasive. And that is, you know, you're, you, you shouldn't use your back this way, or you shouldn't use your back this way. And I think they develop a mindset that you, you have to be careful with your back. Well, sure. You have to be careful with a lot of things, but, but being careful and assessing risk is different than um, being uh, just cautious about things. You know, I mean, some people are just so overly cautious. They develop weakness. And uh, I, I'll give you a good example. I had a patient this morning that I treated that's a post-op shoulder patient. And it's very similar to, to you know, the same situation with a back patient. And that is his physician told him, I don't ever want you to lift overhead again with your shoulder. And so my question to that doctor might be, and to that patient might be, well, did he, did he feel like, did the physician feel like that he got a good repair in your shoulder, a good, what we call purchase of the hardware or the tendon or whatever he repaired in the shoulder? Well, the patient said, yes. He said, my shoulder was the perfect shoulder to perform this procedure on. So if the shoulder joint is designed to raise up over your head, why wouldn't you go back to strengthening it in that method and use it? It just functionally makes sense. Well, the same with the back. The only difference is with the back, a lot of people don't know how to lift. Uh, they don't recognize how to use the hip. And they definitely do very little strengthening on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to the low back. So what does, let's say someone who's never lifted before, they've got an issue like that, either an issue with their back or a shoulder. I know shoulders are very common with folks. As a practitioner and as a coach, like how do you go about introducing them to barbell training? Well, it would, you know, it matters where I see them. If I see them in a clinical environment, the approach is it's similar, but the you know, I'm I'm in my medical world there. If that makes sense, um, I, there are some you know, let's say a physician has. Uh, ordered PT for the patient, prescribed PT, and I'm seeing them because they had a lumbar sprain strain or they have a bulging disc or what they would call a quote unquote bad back. I might treat them a little bit different, but we still go into education. We talk about using the hips as a lever. We talk about using the, the, the back in a straight angle that the back stays in a nice locked straight position when we lift. And then we go through and we start teaching them how to deadlift, how to back squat. I teach them the overhead press too, because that builds the, the midline stability, the core strength. And then we gradually also add other assistive exercises in also. But mo a, a lot of people, when they think of spine strength, they think of the abs, right? Right. I'm going to do sit-ups to get my abs strong, right? The problem with that is that that's not how the spine and the abdominal wall actually functions on a day-to-day -day basis in the human body. It's mostly an isometric muscle group. It's a, it's a group of muscles that stabilize the spine through isometric contraction throughout the day. And then when you volitionally want to use the, the spine to lift something heavier, then you valve salva, you tighten up, you keep that back nice and straight, and you, you hinge at the hip. And so those are the kind of things that we teach. The number one thing is, is I educate them on the front end that this is the proper way to use your hips and your back. You can be lifting, you can get strong over time, and you can get stronger probably than you ever thought you could be. But the biggest limiting factor is going to be their mind. We've got to change their mindset. So we gradually work them through their rehab program if they're a patient. We put them, then I put them into a barbell program, give them some basic level programming. They can either do that on their own in a local gym, or they can then come and see me as a strength coach and we'll work with them one-on-one -on -one and then put them on a program also. Gotcha. Okay. So the bottom line is if you have an issue and you've been leery of getting into strength training, but you've been wanting to, don't be afraid, go in it, go seek professional advice. But what do you do? Like you go to a PT who's not a starting strength coach and they're going to give you the typical advice of here's a soup can and, <laughs> you know, do a shoulder, like what do you do if that's what they prescribe? Well, I mean, 
in every community, there's there's a differing level of expertise in every single community. And, you know, years ago, I, I've been in the fitness industry. My wife and I met when I was 19 years old in a health club where I was a quote unquote personal trainer. I'm not real sure what I knew back then, <laughs> but um, I was a personal trainer. Uh, but, you know, in every industry, we have varying levels of expertise. And so I wouldn't say necessarily because a physical therapist is a licensed PT that they actually possess the knowledge or the experience base to do the type of strength training that, that I think is effective or that you might think is effective now based on the fact that you do starting strength. Um, so it's kind of difficult sometimes. You, you're not real sure what you're going to get yourself into, but, but I can say this. And if you're a patient, and you've been treated for low back pain and you're not getting the results that you want from your physical therapist and, and or your doctor or whoever you're seeing, your chiropractor, whatever medical professional or alternative mes- medicine person you've, you've sought. Um, you can go to uh, starting strength online coaching. Dot com and you can you can seek out a starting strength coach and and I can say this that every single coach that's on that staff has an expertise level on how to do barbell training and could probably help you work through your back back pain and getting back to a healthy strong back where you can live a successful lifestyle that's one thing I know for sure so in a in a local sense if you're dealing with a physical therapist that you feel like you're not making the headway that you want to make then reach out to Starting Strength Online Coaching. You could also reach out to me and I could hopefully find you someone in your area that's a little bit more strength-minded as a therapist. Uh, you know, most th- most physical therapists, they mean well. And I think there's a lot of great physical therapists out there that are very strength-minded today. And we do see a trend in the world of physical therapy to move toward a more active strength training mindset a more preventative mindset, but we still have a lot of physical therapists in our community too, that they're just not effective in their ability to create true uh, muscle hypertrophy strength and adaptive change in the patient. So when we had Jordan Feigenbaum on the show, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum on the show, and you know, he, he highlighted the research that basically shows that weight training is probably one of the safest activities you can take part in. Like soccer is, you're, you're more likely to get injured playing soccer than you are lifting weights. With that said, it is possible in the, in the process of your training to get banged up, experience injuries, some hurts. So in your experience as a coach and as a, as a physical therapist practitioner, what are the most common, I don't know if you want to call them injuries or just dings to the body that you see whenever someone's barbell training? Yeah, I think the thing, the thing we see the most are probably low back sprain and strains. A lot of times, you know, if you're training with, if you're doing any type of training, it's not, it's not if an injury is going to occur. It's really, it's really when, Um, when in your training career, your training life, are you going to get injured? I mean, you can get injured bending over and pick picking up a pencil and, and probably it has happened through cumulative trauma over time, improper lifting, lack of strength in that segment, lack of activity in your lifestyle, maybe a sedentary lifestyle. So, you know, there are a lot of things in life that, that cause injuries, but the, the most common injuries that we see would be low back sprains and strains, shoulder sprains and strains that would probably eventually kind of show themselves as rotator cuff injuries, most likely growing strains like a, you know, an adductor strain through squatting, uh, hamstring strains and sprains. And then also sometimes we see some bicep tendonitis, elbow tendonitis from barbell training, uh, just like we do any other type of training. But like you said, the injury rate in barbell training is extremely low. And, and this is a, this is an interesting, just little tidbit of information years back it's been two or three years back i was doing some studying on olympic weightlifting and and you know what olympic weightlifting that would be the clean and jerk and the snatch so that's a dynamic effort that's speed based that's power based strength based but there's a lot of movement in a, in a very broad range of motion okay so it's even less predictable than barbell weight training where you're doing let's say the press the bench press the back squat and um, the deadlift but i was doing some studies i was doing a study probably two or three years back because i was talking to some parents about using olympic weightlifting for dynamic effort explosiveness for younger athletes and at the time i believe it was the 
American College of Pediatric Medicine had come out with a position statement working with Dr. Kyle Pierce, who works with the USAW, to support. They eventually said that it, if, a, if a child, if an adolescent was going to strength train or do a strength training program, then a safe way to do it would be something like Olympic weightlifting. Because number one, it's coached. Number two, it's predictable. And number three, um, it's something that can be linear based. You can gradually increase the loads over time as technique improves and as strength improves and expertise. And so, you know, I, I think about that in, in this format. If, if Olympic weightlifting is that safe for that young population, how much more safe would just classical barbell training be where it's, there is not as much speed. There's not as much dynamic effort. It's more a controllable motion. So that's the one thing I love about barbell training is I know that when my client walks into the gym or into the clinic that next day, I know exactly what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. Uh, I know the set and rep scheme. There's, there's no unknowns. And to me, to be able to do that and to track that over time, day in, day out, there's this gradual progressional linear model that's developed that creates strength. And the other thing is the connective tissue. The connective tissue gets gradually stronger over time. So the likelihood of an injury is much less, um, apparent than if um, I just went in and did some random exercise workout, if that makes sense. Right. So you just go into the gym, you like go to all the different machines at a random, whatever you just. Yeah. And I, th- I think, I think people have a misconception about barbell training because let's face it, you go into any larger globo gym, you go into any facility and, and you see people doing things that, that, well, you know, now based on, on being trained in a classical barbell program and having a great coach, you know now that that there's a certain way to lift a barbell. There's a skill, right? It's it's not random. It's very specific and it's very methodical. Well, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in gyms that you just you just have to roll your eyes at. It's just it's it's not good training. It's not training at all. It's exercise. And like Rip Rip says, you know, it's exercise is getting hot, sweaty, and tired. But training is outcome driven. It's it's specific, uh, and we we're we're doing something to create a change in the human body whatever that change is, whatever that physiological change is. But, but that's the beautiful thing of barbell training. And, and that's why I think it can be so effective in a rehab model too, is because it is predictive because the patient or the client gradually increases over time, uh, just like they would in any other rehabilitation program. We just happen to be using the barbell more often. Our clinics, all four of our clinics that we presently have have barbells in them. We have, you know, standard weights, I guess you would say plate weights, We have everything from fractional plates to 45 pound plates. And then we also have squat racks, power racks in each one of our clinics. And so our therapists use that. Some therapists would use it more than others, but you'll see that most of my patients use the barbell rack. Almost every single patient will have some application with it. So there's a lot to unpack there with some of the stuff you said. I want to go back to the kids in weightlifting because that's a question we often get. The kid, people want to get their kids with weightlifting, but they probably heard the the rumor that the old wives tell. Is that, what, is that what you say? Is that what they're called nowadays? Like that you know it stunts their growth because it somehow damages growth plates. Is there anything true to that, or is that a bunch of bunk? No, I mean that's a bunch of bunk. I mean I th- I think there is a. a- an age as they're going through their stages of development, their skeletal development, where we have to be more careful than, than other ages. But, you know, with, with younger clients, let's say clients that are 12, 13, 14, and, and not all, let's, let's just say 13, 14 year olds, not all 13 year olds had the same skeletal development as all, all 13 year olds. There, there's a difference. They may be a little bit farther into puberty. They may have uh, more skeletal development. They may be carrying more muscle mass. You can have a, you can have a 13 year old that that's very underdeveloped and you can have a 13 year old that's, that's, you know, six foot one inches tall and 200 pounds and, and very developed uh, physiologically or physically in regards to skeletal structure. So, you know, the key thing we do with younger clients is first of all, we teach them form. We teach them how to move the barbell. And that's built off of repetition and coaching. So in cueing and teaching them. So we teach them first, we cue them and we coach them through all those movements to make sure that they're sound and safe. Let them have fun while they're in the gym. And then a little bit later in life, then we gradually start adding load and put them into a novice linear progression. But I, 
I think the safest method to develop strength in some of these younger athletes, which is not being done very well in high schools today, would be to put these these young athletes, these 13, 14 year old athletes into a, a sound novice linear progression and then just gradually increase that strength over time. If if these strength programs would do that, by the time these kids got into high school, <laughs> some of the numbers would be unbelievable in regards to their strength capacity. And and I think that would roll into their ability to perform their sport, you know. You know, when it comes to what people think kids need for their sport, we don't need to train them specific to their sport when it comes to strength. We just need to get them strong. We get them strong, then the the sport-specific coach can deal with all the sport-specific issues that come with that, that, uh, that, that sport. But our goal as strength coaches is to get them a good foundation of strength, and then they can use it for whatever they want to use it with. So let's backtrack. So you said some of the most common injuries that you might experience while barbell training is spring, backs, lower back pain, bicep tendonitis, something I've dealt with, shoulder stuff. So what happens, let's say you get the back thing, like you're doing a deadlift and while you're pulling, you tweak your back. Do you freak out? Like what do you, what's, what are the immediate steps you should do to start Re- rehabbing that? Should you stop training altogether? What's your approach? Well, the last thing I want to do is is stop a client, whether they're a patient or just a strength client from training or to stop moving. You know, I, I, my, the other starting strength coaches and just some of the people that know me in, in, in professional circles, I always use the term motion is lotion. You know, you, you got to stay moving. It's good for the human body. We want increased blood flow. So there's a, there's a misconception that you injure your back where well, you should stop doing anything for them. Sometimes a prolonged period of time. And that's, that's farthest from the truth. Now we know that, that you should probably get back under load. Now, how you get under load and when you get under load and how much you load is determined based on what type of injury it is. Is it an injury or is it just hurt? You know, I mean, there's a lot of little tweaks that occur along the way. You get a little sprain and strain here. You get a little soreness here. You know, you get a little hurt, quote unquote. Well, that's different than being truly injured. So what, what you want to do first is you, you, you want to seek the help of someone who has, um, you know, a diagnostic background. Uh, you know, I prefer that you, you seek, you know, a sports medicine physician. If you, if it's a minor injury or a minor sprain and strain, then it's something probably that you can take care of yourself. You want to ice the injury directly after the injury. You want to stay moving though. And you eventually want to get back underneath that bar. So, you know, the key is if, if your barbell training as your, as your strength method, but the key there is we do need to get in some of these cases, some form of diagnosis done. Um, and I just say that as a, I, I'll put my white coat on there. <laughs> um, that's not my strength, my strength coach coat. But, uh, you know, if I put my white coat on, then a, an accurate diagnosis up front is important. But let's say you went to your family doctor or a physical therapist uh, based on what state you live in and you got the diagnosis of a lumbar sprain and strain. You know, they're going to tell you stop lifting for a while. Don't barbell train. And that's that's not what I would have you do. What I would have you do is we would gradually go back into lifting. Uh, we might even use a, a rehab method called the STAR rehab model. The STAR rehab model is using a higher rep scheme with lower loads and body weight loads to gradually increase the blood flow to that area, just infuse that area with blood flow so that we can increase the nutrients, increase the healing agents to that area. And then we just linear progression, gradually increase the load over time get you right back into training very quickly. And instead of just kind of hoping the body heals in a roundabout way, we force the body to heal. That makes sense. Well, let's talk about tendonitis. Cause I see this one, this probably pops up for older guys in particular, because when you're young, you're supple, right? When you get older, you get a little stiffer and things aren't as pliable. So what's your approach to, well, first of all, why does bicep tendonitis happen and what do you do to train around it? Well, any, any tendonitis can, it, it matters what we're talking about here. There's there's three stages of tendon injury. We've got tendonitis, tendinosis, and tendinopathy. So a tendonitis is basically just inflammation of the tendon. There's been an inflammatory process. There might be very little damage actually done to the tendon, but the tendon's inflamed through an overstretch, an overstrain, or overuse. It could be, you know, overuse, you know, swinging a hammer, or, or or it could be from lifting. A tendinosis is once we've had 
several tendonitises or we've had several smaller injuries, then there's an actual structural change to the tendon belly itself. And the tendon cells that are in there are, are you have some scar cells in there now, and it's just not as healthy of collagen because collagen tissue is what your body's made out of, and the tendon cells are not as resilient. That's what happens with some older athletes or older lifters. Uh, they get tendonitis from overuse or this sprain or this strain, and then it ends up being a tendinosis. So once it gets warmed up, it feels really good. But before you get it warmed up, or maybe on a cold day or something like that, it's achy and uncomfortable. But once you start using it, it feels pretty good. Then the last thing would be like a tendinopathy. And that's where the actual tendon tears and there's a structural uh, weakness in the tendon. And eventually the tendon could rupture like an, you know, like a, a bicep rupture, distal bicep rupture or a patellar tendon rupture, Achilles rupture. That would, that would be the, the worst thing that could happen because it completely detaches. So the, the way that I treat tendonitis, tendinosis and tendinopathies is a little different based on the severity of the injury. So the rehab model is going to be different based on the severity. But let's say we're dealing with just a classical tendonitis. Uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we're using that tendon. Uh, we may have to reduce the loads for a period of time because of the, the, the structural inflammation that's there. So we're going to use things like ice, deep transverse friction massage. Uh, sometimes it, it's appropriate sometimes to use a corticosteroid injection in that area or to use things like antiphoresis where we use a topical steroid. They also might be taking NSAIDs, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to reduce the inflammatory process in the tendon. But the last thing we're going to do is not use the tendon. I'll tell you, this is a really interesting case. I was treating a guy this morning, or one of my colleagues was treating him, and we were just talking about him together and kind of working together on him. But he's had a medial epicondylitis, which is a tendon inflammation of the medial elbow. It's also called golfer's elbow. And, um, uh, he basically has had this for about two or three years. He's had multiple injections to the area. This is obviously a tendinosis. Um, he's got some adaptive tissue changes in that area. So what the therapist and I have been working on is to start doing some eccentric chin-ups with him, start doing some eccentric curls with him, and start to really load that tendon with eccentric activity, higher reps, body weight loads, and lower loads, but just really flushing that tendon belly with blood, expanding that tendon with blood products and um, and lubrication so that it can heal itself as best possible. We also recommended something like an elbow sleeve with him to keep it warm so that when he's at work and he's not using it, um, we're keeping that body temperature in that area a little warmer. And what he's noticed over time is that it's actually getting better. It's improving. So that's, you know, the number one thing we want to do is we want to keep these patients moving. We might have to, or these lifters moving, we might have to alter load and weight, reduce it, but we're probably going to use a higher rep scheme with more sets. And we're going to use um, eccentric training too, along with that. And then all the other things that we talked about, NSAIDs and ice and friction and some of the alternate, you know, the, the sideline therapies that we can use. We could use e-stem on it, those types of things. Darren, do you uh, treat a lot of runners by chance? I mean, we treat a fair amount of runners in our practice. Um, we, see, we see quite a few. What do you think are the most common injuries you see with those guys? Oh, probably Achilles tendonitis is real common. Plantar fasciitis is real common. Uh, you know, some of them will get some nonspecific knee pain. We'll get some achy knees from having a little arthritis in the knees, hip flexor sprains and strains. Um, uh, sometimes they'll get a little patellofemoral pain from from running with improper form or if they're running hills or trails, those types of things. And is your general philosophy towards those guys too is like keep them moving? Like you're not going to stop running. You might just change the way you train. Yeah, I think with a runner, it's, it's, it's a similar philosophy. The number one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at their strength base too. If, if they're under strength and runners are classically weak as athletes, if they're, if they're 
if they lack strength, which they probably do, I'm going to put them in a classical barbell training program. <laughs> and so we're going to get them under the bar and we're going to get them stronger because a lot of times runners have injuries because of form breakdown and form creep throughout their run. You know, they get tired. Uh, they like the stamina that they need to run with proper form. We may do, we may need to address their form. You know, we need to address the way they run their shoe wear, but with a runner, what I might look at is volume too. A lot of runners are, are can be um, classically over users. They can overtrain. So we're going to look at how much they're running. And one of the things that we that I've done over the years, and and some of this came from my background with CrossFit, and that is learning how to use high intensity interval training or interval running to improve aerobic and endurance capacity without running the high volume that a lot of runners or that a lot of triathletes or endurance athletes normally uh, use. So, so we'll work on, you know, instead, you know, let's say in the past they've used three long runs a week or five long runs a week. We might then come in and change their training model. Well, let's say, let's do some high intensity interval training on this day. Let's do some sprints or let's do some, uh, let's do something like the assault bike and maybe do uh, interval sprints on the assault bike and give your, give your, you, we're, we're still working the hips and legs. We're still working their cardiovascular system. But what we're also doing is give their body a little rest from the pounding, if that makes sense. So the thing we look at with runners would be, uh, we, we check out their training program, the volume that they're running. We look at their form. And then what we're going to do is probably put them into a strength program because it's predictable get them strong, maybe make sure that we're strengthening that connective tissue. And then we can do all the things that we talked about earlier with tendonitis and, and other injuries using modality care and physical therapy care to uh, reduce the inflammatory process along the way and, and get them back to running. This is a, a personal question related to running because I, I, I experienced this. And so like, I think two years ago, yeah, about two years ago, no, a year and a half ago, I did some like wind sprints for like the first time in a long time. And I like, boy, that's painful. It was pain. Like, so yeah, I think I, what happened was after like the day, the next day on my left, like hamstring, like up near my butt, Mm -hmm. it was just this pain. It just hurt all the time. And I think it was like a, some sort of tendonitis, like the hamstring. Mm -hmm. Is there a tendon there by chance? Yeah. Yeah. uh, And it was like for like, I mean, pretty much it's just until fairly recently, like the pain went away, but it took like a long time. So like, what do you do? Like if you're a runner and you get tendonitis there, because I think it might be a hard place to treat. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the hamstring, the hamstring comes up to what's called a conjoined tendon. It's a very, it's where the hamstrings all convert back up in there and they attach on the ischial tuberosity. It's a sit boat. It's what you sit on. And so if you're, yeah, it would, it would it'd really flare up when I was like on a long road trip, I was like, I'd get out of the car and it just hurt so bad. Yeah. You go to stand and you're like, Oh my gosh, that's killing me. Yeah. Well, you start, right. you start having to use that hamstring again, but yeah, I mean, something like sprinting is, is, is perfect to injure that if you haven't been sprinting and here, here's the, here's the, the thing you got to watch sometimes is that when you're doing something like that, like high intensity interval training, sprinting, there's a ton of sport hormones going on in your body, your, your body temperature, you know, I mean, you've got everything warmed up, everything feels great. And, and really a lot of those hormones that are rushing through your body at the time, they're designed to reduce pain. They're, they're designed to reduce the, the, the nociception, the pain response in your body. So, you know, then you get a little overuse and there's an inflammatory process. You may have not torn the tendon, but you may have irritated its origin or the insertion down near the knee when you're talking about the hamstrings. And there's an inflammatory process. So, you know, it swells down in that area. And with the swelling and the the damage to the tissue comes pain. And so, you know, I mean, you probably did the best thing you could do as you, you know, you previously ran and you just said recently you got rid of it. And I bet your barbell training has been great for developing the strength of that origin of that tendon. So with something like that, the number one thing we want to do is we can treat that area. There are things we can do. We can do dry needling to that area. We can do e-stem to that area. We can go up and friction massage. We can stretch it. Uh, we can do strain counter strain work where we do eccentric dynamic loads on it. Uh, but you know what I would do with a patient that has it? And I, I'll give you a good example. I had a, a young football kid that saw me several years back. He played football for a very large high school locally, and he wanted to get – rehab for a hamstring 
tear and, or sprain and strain that he had had. He'd have five different hamstring sprains in the last two years as a football player. Well, his brother was already playing at a Division One college. He had great genetics, so the goal was to get him back to play, playing at a level where he could um, participate in the in the college combine and hopefully get a good school bid to go play football. So, his dad brought him to us. One of my the other therapists, who's one of my business partners, was actually treating him, and I just filled in one day for him, and and I got to talking to the dad, got to know him a little bit, and so we we did the rehab on him. And the way that we rehabbed him was we had him do good mornings, deadlifts, back squats, uh, weighted lunges. Um, you know, we really worked on developing the tendon strength at its origin at that sit bone through eccentric and concentric weight training. So. As time went on, his father contacted me and said, hey, he wants to get stronger. So I think it was December a year ago, he started strength training with me. And so I think we started him in the first week of December. He was back squatting 275 for three sets of five. When we finished with, when I finished with him in February, I think he did three sets of five at 430 on the back squat. I think he was deadlifting close to 500 pounds and uh, he went and sat for the college combine and got a, got a bid to go place uh, football at a, at a school. So, you know, I think that the key there is, is that we, we've got to sometimes give the human body, it, it's based on the severity of the injury. So in a case like yours, if you had torn that, that tendon from its origin, you know, if it had been, do you know the grades of the tears, Brett, the different grades of tears? I don't. Okay, so a grade one would be a minor tear. There's really no structural damage to the tendon where it originates on the bone. Um, it's just an irritation. There's an overstretch. A grade two, there's a very small tear, zero to 25% of its fibers. A grade three, 25, 50% of its fibers, up to 75% of, of its fibers. And then a grade four would be a complete rupture of the tendon. And so, uh, or just barely hanging on there. So, you know, if someone came to me and said they felt a pop up in there and it was very painful and they had very poor hamstring strength, very poor hip extension and knee flexion, then I want to make sure what we're dealing with there. I might even get an MRI of that or a CT scan just to figure out what, what level of tear or injury are we dealing with? Does that make sense? No. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, I think you did exactly what you should have done. Um, you know, it, it, running doesn't make you a stronger runner. It makes you have better aerobic capacity, potentially, and it makes your, you know, your, your, your feet are able to handle the pounding better. You know, your body, you know, you get chafing in the right spots and, you know, you got to do some mileage, but I think also uh, a stronger runner is a, is a faster runner. So you mentioned some alternative recovery or rehab tools. I mean, it seems like in the past, I'd say five years, there's been more attention paid to sort of rehab and recovery. You know, I remember when I started you know, training in high school, barbell training, then it basically was like, if you hurt, go sit in the ice bath and that was it. Now there's all this stuff, which like, as you're as a practitioner, like what stuff actually works and why does it work? You know, you mentioned dry needling, like what is that? Cupping is another one. I mean, what do those do and do those actually do anything? What, what do they do for rehab and recovery? So, I, so I've got to give away all my secrets and tricks. Right. No, you got just a few of them. All <laughs> right. I can't, I can't give away my, 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 my snake oil tricks here, you know? No, I, I think, you know, Unfortunately, there's a lot of things that, that are being done in clinics today that there is not a lot of research to support some of those things. I, I try to stick with the ones that I know, you know, in, in medicine, we use this thing called evidence-based practice. And basically it's a, it's a three-pronged stool and think of a stool that's sitting on the ground and it's got three legs. Uh, one of those legs is research, you know, research and data. And for most of the physical modalities or treatments that are out there, we still lack the quality of research that we would like to see for support of a lot of those modalities. We, 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 we have some pretty good data out there, but we, we still, we still could always use more data. The second stool leg, the second uh, leg would be clinical experience. The, the person that's actually treating you, what kind of experience and anecdotal and observational evidence do they have as a clinician to say that, Hey, I've used this on, on, you know, a hundred clients and it works. I don't care if the research supports it or not, or if the research is less supportive or minimally supportive. I've seen this work. 
And then the third one would be the the patient value or the client value and the client experience. If a client came in to me and said, I've had ultrasound every single time this has flared up and ultrasound helps, I'd be remiss if I didn't use ultrasound, even though I might think that ultrasound is not going to be as highly effective as another method because the patient has built a value in that treatment. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. So, so we, we take, if we take that approach, then some of the things that I think that are very effective on an evidence based model at varying levels of evidence, not all these things have the same level of evidence, but the, the number one thing that we know is the most supported by the literature would be resistance training. Even in the physical therapy world, we know that resistance training using load and weight with set and rep schemes, and and we would vary that resistance training with three different variables that would be volume, intensity, and frequency. Volume, how much are they going to do of it? Frequently, frequency, how often are they going to do it? You know, based on recovery and things like that, based on their injury or, or whether they're, if they're not a patient, you know, based on their training model. And then also um, intensity and intensity could be based on the set and rep scheme. It could be based on the load. You know, there's a lot of things that can, that can vary the intensity, but generally that's the load base of the, of the scheme. So, you know, I think resistance training would be the first thing. And a lot of people think that's old school and a lot of people think that's kind of boring, but, but I think that resistance training would be, is the most effective method for us to rehab, uh, for me to rehab clients today. Uh, the second thing would be able to use my hands. I, I do joint manipulation on patients, sometimes using uh, joint manipulation in the spine, in the extremities. Um, we don't really know why that works. There's a lot of theories that are out there why that works, but, but I generally get a very good response using joint manipulation with certain types of patients and certain types of diagnoses. Um, we use electrical stimulation, e-stim, uh, in varying forms. Some of it's contractile based, where we actually cause a muscle contraction. We're not, we're not trying to get the muscle stronger because that's kind of a debunked theory, but what we're trying to do is get good uh, muscle contraction. And then we also might have the patient volitionally. They can, they try to contract the muscle and then we stimulate the muscle also with muscle stem at the same time. Uh, so we're getting that combined effect. And then we might use E-STEM2 for pain control or for pain mediation so that they can do more activity and be more active and move more. And then we use things like dry needling. Dry needling is a great technique. I mean, dry needling is the Western form of acupuncture. And we know acupuncture has has some has good benefits. Um, but as a therapist that's certified in dry needling, I use dry needling for the physiological effect that it creates. Increase blood flow, um, increase um, firing of uh, the local receptors in the in the region, the improvement in reducing trigger point activity and, and helping the muscle to relax. There's a dry needling technique that we use on the knee that uses a nine point technique where we put needles in nine different locations around the knee. And on an osteoarthritic knee, I can put that that system on them. I put the nine needles in the knee combined with a low current electrical stimulation and they get a great relief in knee pain. And so, um, we use, we use things like that too. And so there's other things that we could use, you know, and there's some modalities that, that are used in the sports medicine world today. And there's really just, there's very little research to support those things. And I try to stay away from those things. So it sounds like what the dry needling does, you're basically creating an inflammation to drive blood there to treat another a subline inflammation, right? Yeah, I mean, th- theoretically, that would be it. You're, you're, and and we would generally use dry needling when the primary healing, primary healing model has failed to heal the region. So what we're trying to do, like you said, is we're trying to create another incident that's that the body would see as an injury, right? And that incident, what we're trying to do is is influence the body to increase the blood flow. It causes a small inflammatory process that's more controllable. And then hopefully through exercise and activity and education, we can get the patient moving again and get the inflammation down. You know, inflammation causes pain. Structural damage causes pain. And so we're trying to get the inflammation down, get the structural damage to heal. But the best way to get that area to heal is to put that tissue under movement. If it's, if it's, you know, if it's a contractile tissue, like muscle tissue, tendon, tendons, we really wouldn't consider a contractile structure on its own, but it's part of the contractile element because it's attached to the muscle. So the muscle attaches 
The tendon attaches the muscle to the bone and the ligaments attach bone to bone. So in those scenarios, we're trying to get blood flow to all those tissues so the human body can heal itself. Okay, so it sounds like, okay, first, the first thing you're going to do rehab is continue re- with resistance training at a different level, you know, probably modify the level or the intensity. And then if that doesn't work, you might you in- incorporate some of these other practices or these other, other methodologies. Yeah, and I'll probably combine it together. You know, if a, if a client comes in and they're having some pain, then I'll, then I'll probably do it. And that's based on the severity of the injury. If, if the injury requires a period, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say someone comes in and they're, they have a post-op rotator cuff repair. They, they rip the rotator cuff off the bone. It's just been repaired with four, three or four anchors. They're in their post-op period. There's certain precautionary measures that we have to take during that period because there's a, there's a structural integrity issue there that we just have to be careful with so we don't re-tear uh, the tendon before it has a chance to purchase into the bone. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So in that scenario, what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm trying to give them pain mediation first. So let's say they come in one day post-op. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start using gentle, gentle, passive range of motion. We're going to clean the post-op wounds up. We're going to dress them. Then we're going to use ice and e-stem to increase the blood flow to the area along with that range of motion, and then give them a home program and send them on their way. As the, the tendon heals and opportunity allows itself, then we'll start to load that tendon gradually over time through kind of a passive to active assistive to active range of motion model, and then add resistive range of motion whenever it's appropriate. So there are times when you're talking about fractures or structural integrity issues where a ligament's been severely damaged, where we got to be careful with, with motion. We still want motion, but the motion is going to be controlled in regards to its range and its volume and how much load we're definitely going to put through it. But with all clients, I'm probably going to combine those modalities and those techniques together. So a good example would be they come in, uh, we do some exercise training with them that day, and then we finish the session with ice, e-stem, whatever else we're going to use. Uh, That's that's what you would consider an adjunctive modality. And how do you know when a patient's like, they're good, right? Because the the healing process, it's sort of like a muddled bleeding, you know, it sort of bleeds to moment to moment, like... Is there like a moment where you realize, yeah, you're good to go. You can just go back to what you've always, what you did, what you were doing before. That kind of sounds like the, 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 the magical looking glass there. (laughs) I I wish I had that exact answer to the exact time. I I know at this time and at this minute you healed, but here's what I teach our, our new therapists that come out of when the DPTs come out of schools and they come into our practices. One of the things that I, we've actually uploaded into what we call our clinical toolbox for our therapist. It's an evidence-based compendium of articles and different text sections out of books that I've read or other therapists have read over the years and, one of them is a pathology text. And and what I did was I just copied the pages that pertain to the healing timelines and timeframes for different types of human tissue. So doesn't it make sense that a tree grows at a certain rate, right? That certain plants grow at certain rates and certain animals grow at certain rates and humans grow at certain rates. And they also heal at certain rates. We, We can generally say that most muscles will heal within two to four weeks and will be pretty structurally strong unless it's a severe tear with a, with a lot of bleeding and, you know, there's a lot of damage to the muscle. But when you're talking about your average sprain strain, you're talking about two to four weeks. And when you're talking about tendons and ligaments, you're probably talking somewhere around six to eight weeks before it's, it's healed fairly well and we can load it even more and more and more. When you're talking about bones, then it's, it's age dependent based on how old the person is. But um, generally we're talking about, you know, most people are in a cast for somewhere between three to six weeks based on the severity of the, the fracture. So the, the first thing you want to look at is what, what tissue am I dealing with here? So, Let's take the case that you had where you most likely had a small tear or disruption of the origin of the hamstring tendon at the the sit bone, right? When you were running. Well, in in that scenario, if you came into my clinic and you could produce a strong contraction, but it was painful, then I know how to grade that in regards to um, damage. And I can give you a general idea how much damage is in there before we even look at an MRI. 
Now, let's say you produce a very weak contraction and it was extremely painful. And I thought you had a pretty good pain tolerance because, you know, a lot of it is neuroscience and pain behavior, right? Some people are just generally more durable than others and they tolerate things more. But let's say I knew you as a, as a, as a friend or a client, a lifting client, you came in and I knew this guy's tough. This guy's tough as nails. And you came in and you produced a very weak contraction in the hamstrings and it was extremely painful. Then that would give me cause to want to seek further diagnostics because I'm thinking this is probably a grade, grade two to a grade three tear or strain and sprain. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So let's say you came in and you could produce no contraction of the muscle. You couldn't extend the hip or flex the knee very well at all. And you had less, less localized pain, but just more diffuse pain in the general region. But it wasn't quite as painful as I would have expected it to be. Now I'm really concerned because the muscle's not contracting in the manner that it's supposed to. The muscle's not functioning. And I'm thinking that one end of the muscle may not be attached. Does that make sense there? Yeah, yeah. So so then from that standpoint, we're going to rehab you based on the severity of the injury. You know, in some of these cases, they're surgical. But once you come into rehab, we look at those time frames. And this is a, gr- a great example would be like a post-op ACL injury or a rotator cuff injury. And we have some general time guidelines that we follow. In, in some of those injuries, you, you're going to find that most physical therapists are very, very cons- conservative on those timelines. And because we're in the medical industry and there's that approach avoidance and, you know, kind of, you know, clinician do no harm, physician do no harm model. And there's a lot of medical liability there. We have to be careful. Um, so I kind of put on two different hats. One hat is a physical therapist and one hat is a, as a strength coach. And so once you can, reasonably handle body weight load. Then we gradually load you over time. When I feel like you're competent in your movement, you're handling loads frequently, then I'll just send you on your own way and let you train yourself and, and uh, just follow up with me, with me when needed. It's great. Well, Darren, this has been a great conversation packed with information. Is there anywhere, anywhere where people go can learn about, to, to learn more about what you do? Well, unfortunately I'm old, so I'm in my fifties and I'm not quite, quite caught up with the whole social media trend, but <laughs> And I'm kind of dysfunctional there, but, but, um, yeah, they can, people can get a hold of me if they'd like to at my starting strength online coaching email, which is D Deaton at SS online coaching.com, or they can get a hold of me through my rehab email address, which is D L D at Riata therapy. That's R I A T A therapy.com. And I still have my, my CrossFit Fort Worth website up. Um, it's former strength and conditioning CrossFit Fort Worth. Uh, hopefully within two months, I'll have a small, I plan to open a small boutique barbell gym in my local community where I'll mostly be doing um, barbell training, but also some conditioning on a need basis, a specific a need basis. So, But I'd love to hear from guys. If you just have a question, a concern, you need more information, that's the best place to get a hold of me in those email addresses. Awesome. Darren Deaton, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate it. My guest today was Darren Deaton. He's a physical therapist as well as a starting strength coach. You can find more information about what he does at Starting Strength Online Coaching. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Deaton. That's D-E-A-T-O-N, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.